The Fountainhead is as much a work of philosophy as it is a work of literature. In the novel, Ayn Rand presents you know, challenging questions that you know, make us rethink the basic questions of human life. And what's interesting is in, in thinking about the novel, in her very first notes for in planning the novel, the first things she thought about were not you know, sort of the characters or the, the literary aspects of the story. The first things she thought about were the abstract ideas that she wanted to convey in the novel. Looking back after the novel was published, she talked about her first ideas for The Fountainhead, and this is what she said. The Fountainhead started in my mind as a definition of a new code of ethics, the morality of individualism. The idea of individualism is not new, but nobody had defined a consistent and specific way to live by it in practice. It's in their statements on morality that the individualist thinkers have floundered and lost their case. So Ayn Rand's goal in writing The Fountainhead was to present a new theory of ethics, a new theory of morality. And what's interesting, though, is that she, she wanted to present a new theory of ethics, but she didn't write you know, a philosophy textbook. She wanted to present it not as a dry, abstract treatise on philosophical ideas. She presents it in the form of a work of literature, a story with characters who, you know, interesting characters who do interesting things. And she, she's presenting a new work of philosophy in the form of a work of literature. And, you know, she often got the question of why, you know, why do you present your philosophical ideas in works of literature? Why, you know, why make that choice? So again, looking back after the novel was published, um, she, said, she had this to say in answer to that question. I have been asked why I chose to present a philosophy of ethics in fiction form. I'm interested in philosophical principles only as they affect the actual existence of men, and in men only as they reflect philosophical principles. An abstract theory that has no relation to reality is worse than nonsense and men who act without relation to principles are less than animals. Those who say that theory and practice are two unrelated realms are fools in one and scoundrels in the other. I wanted to present my abstract theory where it belongs, in concrete reality, in the actions of men. So what motivated Ayn Rand to write The Fountainhead were the intellectual ideas that she wanted to express, the themes of the novel. But she wanted to present those ideas in the form of concretized abstractions, in the form of characters who embody those ideas and live according to different principles. So this is what makes it especially interesting to consider the themes of The Fountainhead, because it's, it's not presented in abstract form. She's not just presenting a theory of ethics. She's showing us what it means to live by different codes of ethics in the stories of the characters in the novel. So in this section of the course, we're going to explore the themes of the Fountainhead, and we'll see how the, the various ideas that she wants to express are embodied by the different characters, and how she shows us these philosophical ideas in the form of the story that she wanted to tell. So the themes of the Fountainhead are primarily moral or ethical themes. Um, this is what she said that, that her goal was to present a new theory of ethics. So let's just start by asking the question, what is ethics? What is morality? Ayn Rand used the terms ethics and morality interchangeably. So what is ethics? Ethics is a branch of the field of philosophy that studies the questions of good and evil. What is, what is good? What is evil? You know, what is right? What is wrong? What is the right way for people to live their lives? Um, what kinds of things are virtuous and what kinds of things constitute vices? Ayn Rand defines ethics as a code of values to guide men's choices and actions. And in a lecture that she gave called Philosophy, Who Needs It? She talks about the different branches of philosophy, and she talks about the kinds of questions that come up in the various areas of philosophy. So she talks about the kinds of questions that the field of ethics or morality asks and tries to answer. 
So these are the kinds of questions that come up in the field of morality. What is good or evil for man, and why? Should man's primary concern be a quest for joy or an escape from suffering? Should man hold self-fulfillment or self-destruction as the goal of his life? Should man pursue values, or should he place the interests of others above his own? Should man seek happiness or self-sacrifice? The Fountainhead has a lot to say about exactly these kinds of questions. So how does Ayn Rand show uh, a code of morality, a new theory of ethics, in the form of a fictional story? Well, basically what she does is she shows different characters acting according to different codes of values. If, if, a, if a code of value, if, 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 if a theory of ethics is a code of values to guide men's choices and actions, what she does is she shows different characters acting according to different codes of values, and we see the different choices and actions that they make over the course of the story. And we, as we trace, we follow their careers, we follow their lives over the course of the story, and we see the radically different outcomes that result from the choices and actions that they make. So by embodying different codes of ethics in the different characters, we see that different theories of ethics, different ideas about morality, lead to characters who are as radically different as Howard Rourke versus Ellsworth Toohey, or Peter Keating and Gail Wynand. You know, they live according to different sets of moral principles, and the choices that they make and the actions that they take in their lives are different as a result of the ideas that are motivating them. Now, Ayn Rand stated the theme of the Fountainhead as individualism versus collectivism, not in politics, but in men's souls. So the basic idea here is to set up a contrast between a morality of individualism and a morality of collectivism. So it's individualism and collectivism not as political theories, but as moral philosophies guiding the, the deepest choices and values that the different characters hold. And Howard Rourke is her embodiment of the morality of individualism. And the other characters in different ways reflect different uh, variations on collectivism. And what she does is she sets up a contrast between these different characters, and she shows how these different philosophies play out in the characters' lives. Now, her goal is not just to set up a contrast and to show different codes of morality. Her goal, obviously, she is a defender of a particular code of morality, the morality of individualism. And so part of her goal is to portray Howard Rourke and to show his philosophy as in certain ways being a right philosophy. In talking about her theme, in talking about the theme of individualism versus collectivism, not in politics but in man's soul, she elaborated in, in her notes in planning the novel, she elaborated on what she was trying to accomplish in the book, and she said this. As a consequence, it is also a definition of what constitutes selfishness and a defense of selfishness in its true spiritual sense. So her goal is to present a new idea of what selfishness means. <clears throat> Howard Rourke um, embodies a certain kind of egoism or selfishness, um, and she wants to show what she means by this new definition of selfishness. And um, so, and this is, this is a, a fairly radical thing that she's doing here. If you think about how we normally understand the concept of selfishness, we don't normally see it as a good thing or as something moral, something that we want to aspire to. So she has th um, the character of Howard Rourke talking about egoism and selfishness, and these are some of the things that he says about it in his, in his courtroom speech at the end of the novel. The first right on earth is the right of the ego. Man's first duty is to himself. All that which proceeds from man's independent ego is good. All that which proceeds from man's dependence upon men is evil. And he talks about America, and he says, This country was not based on selfless service, sacrifice, renunciation, or any precept of altruism. It was based on a man's right to the pursuit of happiness, his own happiness, not anyone else's. 
a private, personal, selfish motive. So Howard Rourke is expressing the idea that, that the egoism is a good thing, that selfishness is a virtue. Now this is a radical idea. If you think about our normal concepts of the way we normally understood the idea of selfishness and selflessness, this flies in the face of what we normally think of as good and bad. If you think about our conventional understanding of these terms, what do you think of when you think about a selfish person? You think about somebody you know, who is, has no regard for others, will trample on other people to get what, what they want. You know, you think of someone like Peter Keating in the novel, the sort of scheming manipulator who backstabs and climbs his way up the corporate ladder over the bodies of his competitors. You know, that's what we normally think of as a selfish person. And if you think about a selfless person, I mean, most of us are taught, you know, from a very early age that this is the essence of virtue, that it's good to be, to, to be selfless in this way. And, and how do we normally understand that? We, we think of it as as putting the needs of others above one's own interests, as not being selfish, as you know, being willing to make sacrifices for the sake of other people. You know, it's, it's exactly the kind of thing that Ellsworth Toohey preaches throughout the novel, right? And it's exactly the kind of thing, you, you know, you think of a, of a person like Mother Teresa, you know, the Catholic nun who devoted her entire life to, you know, ministering to the poor and needy in Calcutta, India. You know, this is held, someone like this is held up as a paragon of virtue, the completely selfless person. So Ayn Rand is taking these concepts of selfishness and selflessness, and she's completely turning them upside down. She's challenging the, the, uh, our, our basic understanding of what these terms mean. And she's asking, you know, is there a different way to understand these concepts that actually makes more sense? And if you think about, I mean, if you, let's, let's take the term selfishness, for example, and, and think about our concept of what selfishness means. Why is it that we regard Peter Keating, for example, as being a kind of selfish character, and why do we regard that as a bad thing? What do we find distasteful about his actions? Well, he's portrayed as, in a very sort of ugly, cynical way, just trampling on other people all over the place. He pushes Tim Davis out of the way in order to take over his work as a draftsman. He manages to, he schemes to push Claude Stengel out of the way to take over his work as the chief designer. He practically precipitates a stroke for Lucius Heyer to become the partner in the firm. You know, he's portrayed as someone who, you know, has no regard, who pursues what he wants, at the expense of others by means of using and exploiting other people to get where he wants. And similarly, it is true for the character of Gail Winan. He's portrayed as a selfish character in a certain way, in the sense that his whole goal and his whole motive is to rule over people, to have power over people. And there's a certain way in which um, you know, his selfishness consists of using other people. He wants to dominate and rule over other people. So this is tied up with the idea that there's a certain exploitation or harm to other people is tied up with the way we think about the concept of selfishness. Ayn Rand looks at our conventional concept of selfishness and she asks the question, why does it necessarily have tied up with it, this idea that to be selfish necessarily involves trampling on other people or exploiting other people. You know, what does selfishness actually mean? And does it necessarily have this ugly, exploitative view necessarily tied in with it? So in Ayn Rand, you know, thought about this a lot. She thought about the question, what does true selfishness actually mean? And in her view, it does not have this exploitative view tied up with it. If you just, if you look at the concept of selfishness itself, if you take, take it literally, if you look at sort of the dictionary definition, what the concept of selfishness means is concern with one's own interests. And that doesn't tell you anything about what is or isn't in your interest, whether exploiting other people is your, in your interest or is not in your interest. Taken literally, the idea of, of being, uh, being selfish just means being concerned with one's own interests, being self-interested. 
and what actually is in your interests and what will will bring about your interests you know these are part of the questions that moral philosophy is designed to answer what is in your interest what isn't in your interest is it good to pursue things that are in your interest or is it not good these are the questions that ethics is supposed to answer it's a mistake to build into the very concept itself this idea that it that that to be selfish necessarily involves a certain course of action or a certain you know pattern of behavior in Ayn Rand's philosophy to be truly selfish to be self-interested does not involve uh, exploiting or harming other people it does not it's not tied up with this this kind of behavior and in the fountainhead she has her character Howard Rourke explain what he means by being a true egoist or a true truly selfish person in the sense that she uh, is is presenting so in his speech he talks about it in this way he says the egotist in the absolute sense is not the man who sacrifices others He's the man who stands above the need of using others in any manner. He does not function through them. He's not concerned with them in any primary matter, not in his aim, not in his motive, not in his thinking, not in his desires, not in the source of his energy. He does not exist for any other man, and he asks no other man to exist for him. This is the only form of brotherhood and mutual respect possible between men. So Ayn Rand is rejecting the idea that selfishness necessarily involves sacrificing others to oneself, that trampling on other people to get what one wants. And she presents a new idea of selfishness, the idea that true selfishness means living independently for the sake of one's own happiness, not being dependent on people in, in this exploitative way. And we see, so if we look at the characters of Peter Keating and Gail Wynand, what we see is even though they seem to be selfish according to our conventional understanding of the term, on Ayn Rand's idea of what true selfishness really means, they in fact are not selfish in this way at all. Peter Keating, for example, is portrayed as somebody who is literally selfless, even, even though he, you know, engages in all these exploitative acts to get what he wants what we find out in the story is his goal in doing all of this is not fundamentally a selfish goal in in Ayn Rand's spiritual sense of the term um, he's he himself has no actual values or desires uh, there he he he's literally selfless he doesn't really want anything what he's what he seeks in the actions that he takes is fame and admiration and wealth and greatness in the eyes of others and his whole existence is focused on other people he's utterly dependent on other people and he is not a, a selfish person in the sense that Ayn Rand is talking about someone who's living independently for the sake of of the happiness that he derives from life. The same thing applies to Gail Wynand. Wynand's whole goal is to pursue power over other men, to be able to force them to do his bidding through the strength of his will and through his wealth and power. And what comes out in the story over the course of, of his, his life, we've, what we find out is that by seeking power over other men, what Wynand has done is in a different way made himself utterly dependent on other men. He's trying to live his life through others. By trying to, you know, by making his goal the goal of ruling, he is dependent on the people he rules. And what we see at the end of the novel is that he really doesn't um, actually have any power. He gained all of his power in the story by pandering to the masses, by giving the people what they want. And what we find by the end of the story is that when he tries to say what he wants, when he doesn't just follow public opinion, the public no longer follows him. And he's utterly powerless to actually shape public opinion for an ideal of his own. So Wynan too, even though he's portrayed as, as a conventionally selfish person, is revealed to be utterly selfless and utterly dependent on others by the end of the novel. And Howard Rourke, in his speech, explains what's wrong and what's second-handed about the idea of trying to seek power over others. A man thinks and works alone. A man cannot rob, exploit, or rule alone. 
robbery, exploitation, and ruling presuppose victims. They imply dependence. They are the province of the second-hander. Rulers of men are not egotists. They create nothing. They exist entirely through the persons of others. Their goal is in their subjects, in the activity of enslaving. They are as dependent as the beggar, the social worker, and the bandit. The form of dependence does not matter. But men were taught to regard second-handers, tyrants, emperors, dictators, as exponents of egotism. By this fraud, they were made to destroy the ego themselves and others. The purpose of the fraud was to destroy the creators. So Ayn Rand is overturning our concept of what selfishness means and putting forward a new idea of selfishness that, that is a positive and noble vision of what it means to pursue one's own interests. It's not exploiting other people, it's living independently, living rationally, living for the sake of one's own interests and pursuing one's own happiness without necessarily having any harmful effects on other people, living in harmony with other people, each person pursuing their own interests, and this is a way to achieve harmony and brotherhood, as Howard Rourke says in his speech. Now she has a similar overturning of our conventional concept of selflessness or unselfishness. You know, normally we think of this as the essence of virtue, that, that what it means to be a good person is to be unselfish, to be, to be concerned with others, to live for the sake of other people. But what she, what she does in The Fountainhead is she, is she takes this idea seriously and she shows what it leads to in practice. And one character I think who is a, a great example of this is the character of Catherine Halsey, Katie Halsey. This is Ellsworth Toohey's niece, and she also is Peter Keating's uh, first girlfriend. So um, Katie Halsey is somebody who really embodies the way most people think about selflessness. She, she embodies this conventional idea of what it means to be a good person. You know, she says that from from a very early age, she's always been taught to be unselfish, that this is the right thing to do. She takes this very seriously. And through the influence of her uncle, Ellsworth Toohey, she really devotes her life to this ideal of unselfishness. Um, you know, in the end, she becomes a social worker so that she can, you know, devote her life to serving the poor and the needy. And there's a very important scene that occurs between Katie Halsey and Ellsworth Toohey. So this is that she's, she's, you know, embarked on her career as a social worker. She's been doing it for a while. And she comes to him seeking advice. And the scene starts out with her saying the following. So she tells him as a child that she always wanted to do right. This was something she took very seriously, that she'd always been taught that it was evil to be selfish. She tried to live up to the ideal of selfishness as best she could. And she says to Tui, I knew that unhappiness comes from selfishness and that one can find true happiness only in dedicating oneself to others. You said that. So many people have said that. Why, all the greatest men in history have been saying that for centuries. But what she's found in her own life is that this unselfishness has not made her happy. She's found herself in her work being sort of nasty, resentful toward the poor people that she's serving, feeling a sort of bitterness and a, and a dissatisfaction with her life. And she presents all of this to, to Tui by way of asking, you know, what's going on here? I've done everything I've always been taught is the right thing to do in life. I've lived, tried to live according to this ideal of unselfishness, and I'm finding that it's making me miserable. You know, what's going wrong? And Tui's answer to her is part of Ayn Rand's analysis of what unselfishness, the ideal of holding selflessness or altruism as an ideal, what it really means. So this is what Ellsworth Tui says to Katie in answer to this dilemma that she poses to him. In essence, what he tells her is that she's still being too selfish. He says, what have you been talking about? What have you been complaining about? about the fact that you are unhappy, about Katie Halsey and nothing else. It was the most egotistical speech I've ever heard in my life. Don't you see how selfish you've been? 
You chose a noble career, not for the good you could accomplish, but for the personal happiness you expected to find in it. If your first concern is for what you are or think or feel or have or haven't got, you're still a common egotist. And Katie says to him, but I can't jump out of my own body. No, but you can jump out of your narrow soul. She says, you mean I must want to be unhappy? He says, no, you must stop wanting anything. You must forget how important Miss Catherine Halsey is, because you see, she isn't. Men are important only in relation to other men, in their usefulness, in the service they can render. Unless you understand that completely, you can expect nothing but one form of misery or another. So what Ayn Rand is expressing here is the idea that selflessness or altruism is more than just, you know, being kind to others or being generous. The, the, what she's presenting is the idea that, that, that it, if you take this seriously as an ideal, what it means is living primarily for the sake of others and sacrificing one's own interests, sacrificing one's own values, giving up all the things that one wants in life and sacrificing for the sake of others. And what she's trying to show here is that far from being some sort of noble, virtuous ideal, holding true selflessness as a moral principle is actually a vicious form of self-destruction. And it's not something that one should aspire to. And what she shows through the character of Catherine Halsey is you know, the kind of spiritual self-destruction that results from the idea of taking this seriously as a moral ideal. So in Ayn Rand's view, the conventional way that we normally understand the concepts of selfishness and selflessness is fundamentally mistaken. And what she argues is that basically what we have been presented with throughout history, that history's great moral teachers have basically offered us a false alternative. That the, the choice that we've been offered is you know, either um, sacrifice others to, to ourselves or sacrifice ourselves to others. And so we have the conventional concept of selfishness, which in, involves exploiting and using other people, sacrificing others to ourselves. And the only possible alternative to that, according to what we've been taught, is to sacrifice ourselves and to give up our own values, to sacrifice our lives for the sake of others. And she argues that, that this is a, a false alternative. And the way Howard Rourke, explains, Howard Rourke explains this point in his courtroom speech, and he puts it this way. As poles of good and evil, man was offered two conceptions, egotism and altruism. Egotism was held to mean the sacrifice of others to self, altruism the sacrifice of self to others. This tied man irrevocably to other men and left him nothing but a choice of pain, his own pain born for the sake of others or pain inflicted upon others for the sake of self. When it was added that man must find joy in self-immolation, the trap was closed. Man was forced to accept masochism as his ideal under the threat that sadism was his only alternative. This was the greatest fraud ever perpetrated on mankind. This was the device by which dependence and suffering were perpetuated as fundamentals of life. The choice is not self-sacrifice or domination. The choice is independence or dependence, the code of the creator or the code of the second-hander. 